Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a ranked family portrait on what I would call one of the most important houses in the history of perfume. And this is really a celebration of this house. And I'm going to show you the bottles in my collection. Uh, if you watch some of my old, older videos, you will have seen a Guerlain family portrait where we talked about some of the bottles in my collection for that house. Uh, and, you know, the house of Guerlain, uh, for me, really took love and appreciation of perfume to the next level because there were other houses that really may have got me started into the journey, specifically houses like Creed and Amouage, those kind of niche houses kind of got me going. But once I discovered Guerlain in their history, it was, you know, a completely different feeling. It was almost like holding an artifact in your hand when you're holding some of these old Guerlain. So first of all, uh, I have to say that this was probably one of the hardest videos I've ever done as far as picking and choosing where things go because Guerlain is probably my favorite house. Um, although I don't like where they're going, I don't like the direction that they're going, uh, and you'll see that in my choices. Many of the newest stuff is towards the back end of the ranking, and many of the oldest stuff is towards the front end of the ranking. Uh, and I had a couple different ways that I had to decide on how I wanted to do this. So what I ended up settling on is a top 35, okay, uh, with three honorable mentions. And we'll talk about why the honorable mentions were honorable mentions and not ranked. Um, and the other thing you'll notice is that there's no extras in my, well, there's one extra or two, but most of, you're not going to see, you know, Le Bleu extra. Uh, Jiki X-Ray, Mitsuko X-Ray, I just, I don't have them. I've never tried any of those iconic X-Ray. Val de Nuit with the amazing propeller bottle, I've never tried it, right? And so uh, I, I thought about how I wanted to do this. Did I want to just lump all of the, you know, EDT and Mitsuko, uh, you know, Mitsuko, EDT, Eau de Parfum, and Cologne all together? Because really, they're almost like three different fragrances. And so that's what I did. So you will notice that uh, I did split up the Eau de Toilettes, the Eau de Parfums, and the Eau de Colognes where applicable into its own little category. So uh, it's going to make this ranking probably a little different than most reviewers, if you will. I'm not a, you know, traditional YouTube reviewer anyways. I'm not doing it for the fame of YouTube or to get free bottles from these brands. As you can see, I don't need the free bottles. Uh, I'm just doing this for the love and the appreciation of the art of perfumery. And so I hope you guys get something out of this. Uh, this was extremely difficult for me to do. So without fur further ado, let's get into this. So first of all, let's do scent of the day, as is customary. And it is a good one. It's uh, November the 6th today. And this is the perfect time of year to wear scents like this. The weather is just starting to kind of cool off here in Texas, although it isn't cold yet. There is still you know, it was in the 60s and 70s today, uh, but this worked beautifully. This is Serge Luton's Cher Guy, and Cher Guy came out in 2001, and it used to be, uh, let me just grab my microfiber cloth here. So Cher Guy used to be a Fragcom darling, if you will, uh, back in the day. It, um, it was extremely hyped, especially maybe 10 years ago or so. Five to ten years ago, this was extremely hyped on YouTube. All of the uh, YouTube channels that were big at the time talked about what an amazing fragrance this was, and they're exactly correct. Uh, and, you know, this is many people's only experience with the House of Serge Luton's uh, because Shergi was so hyped. And I'll tell you what, I love this stuff. Every time I wear it, I'm reminded of the genius interplay between the tobacco... Uh, the resins, the hay, you know, there, there's just such a beautiful, smooth iris note in here that rounds everything out. It is lovely, and I love the dark juice color as well. I love that, you know, even though Serge Luton's uses food coloring or whatever to darken the juices, I think it goes beautifully with the scent. So if you can find one of these older bottles, do it. But I hear that the new version is quite nice as well of Shaggy. I just uh, refuse to buy any of the new Serge Luton's bottle. I'm boycotting their new bottles. I will not own it, even though I want a new bottle of 
um, La Couche du Diable, I won't buy it because it only comes in the new bottle. So I bought Decan instead. But anyways, that's my scent of the day. So this is going to be a long video. So I hope you got your seatbelt on. Uh, so here's how I decided to do this. We're going to do the three honorable mentions. So number 38, 37, and 36, if you will. And then it'll be a top 35 countdown of my favorite Guerlain's. Almost impossible to do because, like I said, it's my favorite house. But let's get into this. So first of all, honorable mention number one or number 38, if you will, is because I have not worn this yet. I got it recently within the last week or two and I have not had a chance to wear it. So I can't really fairly put it uh, in a ranked list. But I did want to include it in the video because you will hear about it on the channel very soon. And it's a creation from Francis Kirkjohn. And it came out in 2005 and it's called Rose Barbar. Now this is the only, this is a 10 ml bottle. And this is the only new bottle like this you will see on my channel. Uh, these new bottles are exorbitantly expensive. They are supposed to be refillable bottles, even the new, you know, 100 mil or, or 200 mils. I don't know what sizes they sell now, uh, but even those larger bo bottles are supposed to be refillable. And this is supposed to be a floral powdery scent. So there's aldehydes, Bulgarian rose, fenugreek, Turkish rose, absolute, underwood, honey and patchouli. The honey makes me very excited to try this. I think this is a rose fragrance I'll really like because I love honey. Um, but I haven't worn it yet, so I can't really, like I said, fairly put it in a ranked list. So number 38 or honorable mention number one is Rose Barbar. Honorable mention number two is going to be Apre Londe. And here's why. Uh, I did an early impression video on this and I said this is one of the most iconic scents and I was very blessed to get to talk about it with you guys. This was very kindly sent to me by Rachel. Thank you again, Rachel. Uh, and you know, I wanted to wear this and, and talk about it before I did the video on Frederick Mall's Lo Diver because that was uh, heavily inspired. Jean-Claude Elena was heavily inspired by Apre Londe. And, um, the, the reason that this is here is, you know, this was a revolutionary fragrance at the time. Apparently, um, it was this para anise aldehyde. It was first synthesized in the mid 1800s. That was used here. This came out in 1906, so it's a very old Guerlain. Uh, and you know, I got a chance to do an early impression where I kind of wore it to bed really quick, or or sprayed it on, had it on my skin for an hour or two, and talked about it. Didn't give it a full wear. Um, and so this could be number one on someone's list. This could be last on someone's list. It just depends. But the beauty of these old gear lawns, how do you rank that? You know, I mean, it wouldn't be fair if I just randomly put this in the list somewhere. So since I don't have a full bottle or at least a decent sized decant where I've worn it and understand it, I'm just putting it at honorable mention number two, but it definitely deserves uh, to be mentioned in the list of all of the great Guerlain. So Apre Londe, this is the Eau de Toilette. I would love to smell the X-Ray uh, because apparently um, there is this lovely uh, heliotrope and violet and this almond-like quality. And uh, the almond-like quality really did remind me of Thierry Vosser's use of almond in some of the fragrances that he has done over the last, you know, 12 years or so with Guerlain. Uh, and so it was a really good experience. If you haven't watched my early impression of Apre Londe, go do it. I think I did it justice for someone who, you know, only had it on my skin for a short amount of time. It's how do you break down an all-time classic in an hour? You know what I mean? So that's why it's honorable mention number two. And honorable mention number three is because this fragrance could not be, uh, ranked in this list because I couldn't put it any lower. Even if I put it last... It wouldn't talk, it wouldn't speak to the volumes of just what an absolute shite fragrance this is. Uh, it's Guerlain's Oud Cole. So it's their newest one from this year, 2022 release. This video, there's a little bit of a hidden gem in. If you go watch it, you'll see an amazing unboxing from Italy where we I unbox some uh, just uh, Italian gems that are, you know, mind-blowing, basically. There were some Chanel, Croix de Russie, uh, Eau de Cologne from 50 or 60 years ago, very old stuff, uh, 200 mils of Bellamy, just amazing fragrances. I should have 
done it own its own video for that unboxing because there were some great vintage fragrances. If you watch that unboxing and you're like, man, I would love to try to get in contact with the gentleman from Italy that sent these. He's very professional. I can vouch for him. I will send you his information. He has basically given me the green light to send uh, his contact information. He uh, speaks via WhatsApp. You can text him and, and you can look at all the pictures of the stuff he has. His name's Antonio, ultra stand-up guy. And so you can check Antonio out if you're interested in seeing what vintages he has in, but Italy has some amazing vintage fragrances. But so that was at the start of the Oud Cole uh, early impression video, but I at least got a chance to give this a full wear for the day. And I was very disappointed in this. I think this is a pathetically bad fragrance. And the fact that they are charging $360 or whatever the, you know, uh, retail prices for Oud Cole is just an absolute shame that Guerlain has gone down this path, honestly. I mean, and I heard the other two are not much better. Oud Nude and, and Cherry Oud are from what I hear, but I have not sniffed them, but I'm not excited. This was supposed to be the darkest of the bunch. And honestly, I'll tell you what I would buy instead of this, if you can get your hands on it at a decent price uh, whenever we get there. So that's why that turns out to be honorable mention number three, because I don't think I could put that any lower with that disgustingly cheap praline smell. Uh, it, not a fan at all. Not a fan at all. Cheap oud smelling fragrance that uh, should not belong in a Guerlain li lineup. Okay, so let's get started. Number 35 uh, is going to be a fragrance with some sweetness to it, but I still like it. But the sweetness puts it at the very bottom of the ranking. Um, you know, mostly because I associate that sweetness with this uh, juvenile-like aspect. And I think this is a juvenile fragrance to some extent, but it's very well done. If you're somebody who is wanting to maybe take a step up from the generic designers that everyone is wearing uh, who's in their teenager years or early 20s or college or just graduated from college, this would be the fragrance I would recommend for them to try. Uh, it's called L'Homme Ideal Eau de Parfum. And so this is coming in at number 35. This has that almondy aspect. Actually, the whole Lome Ideal line is based around almond. Uh, and Thierry Wasser uh, put out the EDT, uh, I believe, in 2000. And the original Eau de Toilette, I can't remember, but I think it came out in 2000 and um, maybe five years ago, five years before the Eau de Parfum. This came out in 2016, if I'm not mistaken. I know his very first fragrance for Guerlain when he took over for, from Jean-Paul Guerlain, when Jean-Paul Guerlain was forced to retire, um, was Guerlain Homme, which is a little higher ranked on this list. But for cold weather, and if you're someone that likes designer perfumes, I think this is a good designer fragrance. It's uh, almond with spices, rose, frankincense, vanilla. The vanilla is very um, prominent, you could say, but Guerlain does vanilla better than any house. Uh, if you want a vanilla fragrance, you can't do, you know, better than Guerlain, in my opinion. And there is this leathery, slightly leathery base. It doesn't smell like a true leather note, like the leathers I love, like Bellamy or something like that, but there is this leathery aspect to the base with Tonka. And this is a designer take on Tonka. So it does have that sweetness, if you will. Um, but uh, I'll, we'll get to later on in the video what I think is probably the best Tonka fragrance money can buy. And it is a Guerlain. But uh, this is coming in at number 35, L'Homme Ideal Eau de Parfum. Okay, so number 34 is the flanker that came out in 2020. So just a couple years ago, this came out. And we're staying in the Lome Ideal line. So these are kind of bottom of the barrel on this list. But they're good designer fragrances in my opinion. And I do enjoy this even though it's sweet. I like this a little bit more than the Eau de Parfum because they've added uh, a note of tobacco, which I absolutely love. So it's like this tobacco plum, like this plum tobacco. And it's uh, Lome Ideal Extreme. So this is the Extreme version. And in... 
LVMH's Infinite Wisdom. They did not release this in the United States, and I think this is probably the best version. It keeps that sweetness from the Eau de Parfum, but it goes away from kind of that cherry vibe. There's a little bit of this vanilla, almondy, cherry-like vibe with the um, Eau de Parfum, okay? With the Extreme, it goes more into this... Um, spongy heliotrope with plum and lots of cinnamon and tobacco and leather. And it's that tobacco-y vibe that I think makes this my favorite from the line. Many people say this is disgustingly sweet, and it is, but for what this line is trying to do, I think this one does it the best. So I'm very glad to have this bottle um, because it's not sold in the United States, but I think it is still available but they only sell it uh, overseas in Europe. So number 34 is Low Medial Extreme. Number 33, and um, this is tough because many people consider this probably one of their favorite Guerlain's, but for me, it was just way too harsh. Uh, I will wear it and talk about it, and I plan on doing full reviews on all of these at some point in the future, so you will get a full review on everything. It's just a matter of when and time and stuff like that. But uh, number 33 is Guerlain's Santal Royale. So Santal Royale came out in 2014, and it comes in at number 33, just one step above the Lome Ideal line for me because of the very harsh nature of this fragrance. It's very loud. It's very synthetic. It really reminds you of uh, some of the cheaper Middle Eastern fragrances. Uh, it doesn't have that Guerlain posh quality, you know, that timeless Guerlain luxury feel that you expect when you buy a Guerlain. This is uh, Terry Vasso trying to bring Guerlain into the modern age with this Middle Eastern style. And, you know, it is technically a rose oud with that Middle Eastern amber and um, peach. And the peach note is nice. There is some floral. There's jasmine and neroli in the top. And it mixes with the rose, and so you have to like the rose, the floral aspect here. If you're a guy that, if you smell a rose in your fragrance, you run the other way, this is not for you, okay? Uh, but this is completely unisex to me, would smell amazing on a man or a woman, but it does have that deep, heavy, Middle Eastern vibe to it, and it's very, very loud, so you really have to be careful with the trigger, and it lasts forever. You know, you could take a shower and scrub, you know, your uh, scrub your hand or your wrist or your neck wherever you apply this and you could still potentially smell it even after the shower it is very intense but that's what many people love about it uh so but for me santal royal comes in at number 33. number 32 is the aforementioned uh guerlain homme and this is the eau de parfum intense now they don't call it the eau de parfum intense anymore and it's not in this bottle anymore even they've now put this line uh in the bottle that looks like this so it's a square bottle it's just guerlain om eau de parfum so they have an eau de toilette uh and they have an eau de parfum now and so the eau de parfum is what the eau de parfum intense used to be if that makes sense guerlain loves changing bottles they love changing uh, names of fragrances, as you'll see, we'll talk about as the video goes on. But this was Thierry Vosser's first um, masculine release whenever he basically came to power, whenever he became the official nose of the Guerlain Empire. And this is a very good perfume. Uh, this is basically a vetiver-based fragrance, okay? Uh, and so you do have to like vetiver, because vetiver is the main player of this fragrance, but it's mixed with lime, and there's this boozy rum, peppermint, there's this mojito-like vibe in the opening. It literally is mojito in a bottle uh, when, you, when you first spray. But it dries down to this patchouli, this cedar, and this uh, vetiver, okay? And the vetiver is kind of the star of the show to me in the dry down. The mojito feel is the star of the show in the top. But if you wanted a perfume that was fresh, and I usually wear this in summer, okay? This is usually a warm weather fragrance. But if it's the heart of winter and you're tired of wearing the, you know, the tobaccos, the heavy vanillas, the heavy leathers, and you want something that, you know, uh, is a little fresher, this could be an amazing wear for, for cold weather for me. Um, 
if you're the kind of person that likes to maybe mix in something a little fresher, if you get tired of the heavy perfumes, I love the heavy fragrances. So this is usually a summer wear for me. Uh, but even though there's this boozy mojito vibe, it's still very classy and it's still great for the office. This is a great office. Vetiver in general to me, I think is a fantastic note for the office. It's very austere, very serious, very aloof, um, almost like someone in a position of power, you know, vetiver doesn't play to me. There's very few playful vetivers, but that is one of them if you if you wanted to call it a playful vetiver because of that mojito vibe. Okay, next is a decant. And I've worn this within the last couple months. Uh, and I think I've done maybe a couple wears since I've had this decant, full wears. And, you know, I don't know what to think of this. I had much higher expectations for this perfume. Um, so at number 31, this is Abbey Rouge's X-Ray. Okay, so again, I'm not lumping this in with, you'll find the Eau de Toilette is much, much higher on the list, very close to the top, actually. Uh, but the X-Ray for me did not, um, didn't fulfill my desires of what I expected an X-Ray to be. It came out in uh, 2009, and it's now officially discontinued. So I do have a decent uh, amount of juice. Oh, man. I've got a decent amount of juice left, as you can see, so I've got enough to wear it more and talk about it. But what ends up happening with the X-Ray, or what, ends up, what ended up happening on my skin anyways, I should say, is that the... Um, beautiful powdery, citrusy element of the uh, Eau de Toilette, which I absolutely love, doesn't really come out on this. It jumps directly into the heavier spiced patchouli uh, with vanilla and leather. And it you would think I would love that leather, but for whatever reason, it comes across as like it lost the sparkle of the Eau de Toilette. Can't, almost like it's trying too hard. It's It's very... Uh, dense and heavy. Uh, it doesn't project much. It does sit very close to the skin like you would expect an x-ray to do. Uh, but I don't know, that heavy spice feel, you know, it feels like um, in trying to make it heavier and trying to almost like prove to people that this is a heavier x-ray, it lost what made Abbey Rouge special. So that's why the x-ray uh, comes in at number 31. And number 30 is also a flanker, uh, or uh, I wouldn't call it a flanker, I'm sorry, I take that back, but it is one of those uh, Guerlain uh, perfumes that has now changed names, if you will. So it is, um, I think it's now called, uh, I'm going to have to look it up, but uh, Guerlain... Louis is what it used to be called. Now it's called Oile Porpri. Okay, so I love the boxes on these old Guerlains. Uh, and so that's this comes in at number 30, Louis, but it's now not called Louis anymore. So if you can find these bottles, but the prices have gone way up on them uh, because these were 50 mil bottles and the new bottles are, I think, 100 mils and they like tripled or quadrupled the price on, on this fragrance. So they changed the name. It's apparently the exact same fragrance. But this is, uh, the reason that this is here is that uh, this is Guerlain doing what Guerlain does very well. This is a beautiful carnation, vanilla, leather. It's got the warmth of benzoin and it has a lovely clove note to it. There's this spicy clove aspect to it. One of the best carnation fragrances money can buy though. And it really does, um, it really does... Uh, do what you would expect a Guerlain that plays with vanilla to do, okay? And so um, you will see as the video goes on, Guerlain's vanilla scents are very high on my list. Uh, and one of the reasons this isn't higher is just because there's no way it can compete with what I consider to be some of the best vanilla fragrances of all time. But if you just take this by itself, Okay, a work that was put out by Delphine Jelk with a little bit of Thierry Vosser's help in 2017. I think this is a very good fragrance. Um, completely unisex. You do have to like that, you know, uh, winter, benzoiny, you know, warm, vanilla. Um, 
with spicy carnation. And the thing about carnation is that carnation and clove actually share similar... Um, carnations and cloves have similarities when you smell them, okay? And I think there is a scientific reason for that, but I, I don't know what I don't know what the actual term is. I'm sure someone will say. Maybe it's like eugenol or something. I can't remember exactly what it is. But uh, I'm sure someone will leave it in the uh, in the comments down below. But uh, so there is this spicy carnation clovey thing going on, and it really does contrast the vanilla beautifully. So I'm really glad to have this. Um, so it comes in at number thirty, Guerlain's Louis. Okay, number thirty or twenty nine. Uh, number twenty nine is going to be a flanker of Abbey Rouge, and it's called Dress Code. Okay, so Dress Code has uh, a new bottle every year when it was available. So it initially came out in 2015, uh, and they did it in 2015, 16, 17, uh, and I think that could be it. Maybe only three, maybe 2018 as well, four years. Um, and so this is a 2017 bottle. So every year when you look, you're going to see a different bottle. Do not pay, you know... $500, $600 for the original 2015 batch. They're all basically the same fragrance, just a different bottle every year. So this is a tester I got from Moodasir, and thank God I did because the prices have skyrocketed. And this is, um, this is a great example of why it's important to get your nose on a bunch of fragrances and trust your own nose because this fragrance, to me, uh, is something that Thierry Wasser took a little bit of this concept and put it in Oud Cole in 2022. So I would not buy Oud Cole. I would buy Abbey Rouge Dress Code. If you kind of like the DNA of Oud Cole, uh, there's no Oud in Dress Code. Uh, but I think this is better than the X-Ray and I definitely think it's better than Oud Cole to me. Uh, if you wanted this DNA, forget about Oud Cole. Try to find a, a relatively respectable priced uh, dress code flanker bottle because I like wearing this more and even though there is this sweetness to it uh, it's Terry Vosser does sweetness in a way where I can stand it as you can notice I, I own full bottles of a couple of the low medial lines which are very sweet uh, and ditto with the dress code flanker but it's a good sweet there are certain sweetnesses that I cannot put up with but I really like the, the way Thierry Vasser uses the Tonka and the vanilla. It's very Guerlain-esque, you know. Uh, but for the modern century, for someone that wants to wear something modern, someone that wants to, they don't want to wear, you know, a fragrance that came out maybe 100 years ago. They want to wear something that's more modern. I would recommend trying Dress Code. It's a shame it's discontinued. Uh, I feel like you know, sometimes they discontinue some of their best, but uh, I really do like dress code. I'm very glad to have a bottle. Very lucky to have a bottle, I would say. So this one might surprise some people, but remember, I'm ranking this based on my love of wearing the perfume, okay? So that's kind of my criteria here, is how much do I love to wear a fragrance? Uh, and so at number 28, this is uh, one of the most iconic fragrances of all time, but I just can't put it higher because... Excuse me. I struggle when I wear it sometimes, and it's not every time, but it's maybe 50% of the time I struggle. Uh, half of the time it's beautiful, and I think it's one of the best sandalwood fragrances I've ever smelled. And the other half of the time, uh, I tend to get a little bit of a headache with it. It could be the white florals. Uh, it could be, you know, uh, a number of, of, of different reasons, but uh, it's Guerlain Samsara, okay? And again, I know I'm going to get flack for putting Samsara at number 28, but I just... Um, the other thing is, is this is a UK031 bottle. So I think this is maybe like a 2001 batch, if I'm not mistaken, right when they stopped using the real sandalwood. Um, I know Rudy and Rich did an experiment where they looked up to see exactly how much... Um, or exactly what the last year real Mysore sandalwood uh, was used by many of these houses, and it was right around 2000, 2001. So I don't know, maybe this is one of the earlier batches that has no sandalwood in it, or maybe this is one of the later batches that just barely squeaked by with some of the real Mysore sandalwood. Well, obviously they all have sandalwood, but real Mysore sandalwood in it. 
that was the big selling point of the original Samsara when it came out in the late 80s, is this was supposed to be uh, something like 30% sandalwood. And I could totally see how this is a very meditative fragrance. Uh, if you look at the bottle, I mean, it almost reminds you a little bit of a temple. You know, it, it literally does have this meditative, relaxing feel to it. It's just, there's something about the way the florals interact. Uh, I think it's the ylang ylang with jasmine. I think those two, that combination gets me here. Uh, but the peach is beautiful. The iris is beautiful. The sandalwood is out of this world. There is that guerlainade. Uh, and, you know, if you know Guerlain fragrances, you will detect that Guerlainade, uh, that Tonka, vanilla, amber creation that Guerlain created for the base of their fragrances. Um, but this is a good perfume. Like I said, this could be number one on some people's Guerlain list. But for me, uh, I just have to put it at number 28. Okay, number 27 is what I consider to be the best Tonka fragrance money can buy. And I've smelled a lot of them. Uh, and I almost even sold this. And this just goes to show how strong of a lineup Guerlain has. That this is number 27 and I'm calling it the best Tonka fragrance money can buy. But it is very true <clears throat> to the heart of... Um, you know, the DNA of Guerlain, and this is called Tonka Imperial. So Tonka Imperial is a creation by Thierry Vosser. I love these old bottles, by the way. I'm sad they got rid of it. This is so classy. You know, the Guerlain name right there on the front, the plate on the side. Uh, I love that logo, the Guerlain face as the sun, if you will. Uh, and this one, you know, they had trouble with the bottles with the bulb sprayers, so they finally replaced it with a sprayer that worked, and then they discontinued this gorgeous bottle. But um, Tonka Imperial came out in 2010. It's almond, rosemary, tobacco, tonka, frankincense, cedar wood, and stone pine wood with a little bit of jasmine. And it's got that um, big dose of bergamot when you first spray. The thing that put me off about this originally is the sweetness. But the more I kind of forced myself to wear it, the more I realized that it really did show you different portions of the Tonka bean. Uh, and I have to give a shout out to my friend Russian Adam from the House of Arige La Doré for sending me some of those materials because getting to smell the actual Tonka bean itself uh, really highlighted for me what a uh, beautiful representation of Tonka this is. So Tonka Imperial for me is uh, probably the gold standard when it comes to Tonka, but uh, it does have this, you know, almost like this fresh bakery. If you've ever smelled Roja's um, Sweetie Oud, how it has that fresh, that bakery fresh, like you just walk by a pastry shop at 9 a.m., you know, and, 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 the fresh baked biscuits, uh, croissants are wafting out of the out of the store. The pastries, it has a little bit of that vibe to it, but that's just Tonka. Tonka has some of that, and it also has that almond note. And I think Thierry Vasser did a fantastic job using the almond note in the Low Medial line, and I think he did an even better job using it in Tonka Imperial. Uh, and if you smell that almondy. Uh, a nice opening of uh, Apre Londe. You'll really appreciate the almond note in stuff like Tonka and Pitiao. So that's why it's so important to kind of understand the history of, you know, some of these fragrances, especially these all-time classics. So even if Apre Londe is not for you, you should try to get your nose on it. Okay, next is another one I might get some flack for putting it here. I know this could be Rich Mitch's favorite um Guerlain, but for me, it's coming in at number 26. It is Ensemble's Mythique. So I honestly had this higher initially, but the more I kind of, um, you know, really thought about where the rankings will go, and some of it was kind of last minute changes, some of it as I was going through my head, how the listing feels does it feel natural this one I had to drop it down a couple notches because I couldn't put it above the next two uh, and but this is a fantastic perfume especially for someone that's very introspective okay 
So if you're somebody who uh, is a little bit of an introvert, or maybe you're having one of those days where you just want to look out at the ocean and be alone with your thoughts, you know, this is a fragrance that really makes you turn inwards. It makes you look inwards. Uh, and I think the reason is because Ensemble Mythique has this uh, aldehydic rose opening uh, with real ambergris. And that real ambergris really gives you this vastness of the ocean. I mean, it really gives you this feeling like you're this big in, you know, a world of billions of people, which obviously you are. But sometimes when you walk around in your daily life, you feel like you're the only person, you know, in the world, right? Uh, you, you, you go about your day focusing on yourself and stuff like that. This makes you feel like you're staring at a machine in motion that's much bigger than yourself. That's, that's the best way to put it. Uh, especially if you look up at the stars and you see how many there are. You know, it has that vibe to it for whatever reason. But it is a beautiful rose fragrance. And I mentioned that uh, Eugene's fragrance from uh, La Dowler Exquise uh, from the brand Less Up Straits. Eugene from the channel You Smells Good. His uh, new release reminded me a little bit of Imitation Man by Amouage, right? But it also had little touches of Ensemble Mythique to me, and it's probably the rose animalic contrast, right? And so La Dallaire Exquise uses Castorium, and it uses rose, and Ensemble Mythique uses rose, and aldehydes, and ambergris. And the ambergris in here is, I think, what adds that intrigue. You know, it, it adds that sparkle, that ambergris pop, that pop of ambergris. Uh, and it is beautiful. Yes, I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. And I could totally see how this could be kind of like a grail scent for me. Uh, I just, I had to be, I much more prefer wearing Imitation Man or wearing uh, La Dalle Exquise, to be honest with you. Those are just more my style. But Ensemble Mythique is a fantastic fragrance. So, and this is part of the problem with rankings is something has to be at 26, right? Could this easily be higher? Absolutely, but you know, when you're doing a ranking like this, you have to kind of make hard choices. This one was a tough choice for me. All right, so number 25. Let me um, let me turn this thing off. It's driving me crazy, okay. All right, thanks for that. So number 25. Uh, Number 25 is a leather fragrance that I think is underrated, extremely underrated. I'm a big fan of this, and I actually did a This Is Not A Top 10 on one of the most important notes in this perfume, and it's Osmanthus, so you can go check that out. Uh, this is a 2019 release, and it's called Queer Entends. Now, if you know my taste, you know I'm a huge fan of big leather fragrances, okay? I love stuff like Bellamy. Uh, Leonard Porom, Pure Distance M. Those are like my grail leathers, you know what I mean? And this is a big leather fragrance. And I think the fact that there is this huge amount of um, uh, IBQ, isobutylquinoline or whatever they call it, uh, I think that's what kind of puts people off with this fragrance because it is sharp, it's non-apologetic, and it's in your face, okay? And if you smell you know, some woody ambers, you might get this confused with uh, fragrances that use big, heavy, woody ambers. I don't get that as much. I mean, obviously there are woody ambers in here to some extent, um, but they don't smell cheap to me. Uh, I think they're very well done. I just think the volume on this is cranked up to an 11 because this is for the Middle East market, but I love heavy leathers. Bella Me is my favorite fragrance of all time. So this fits right in. This is like a modern, you know, 80s leather fragrance done in a Middle Eastern style. But the main notes are basically just uh, osmanthus, leather, and a little bit of woods and some tobacco. Those are basically the main, main notes. There's also a touch of ylang ylang uh, and a touch of musk. But man, if you like big, heavy, leathery fragrances, you have to smell Queer Entente. Um there could almost even be a slight touch of frankincense or something a little bit smoky, but Queer Entente is absolutely amazing. 
So it, it comes in at uh, number 25. Number 24. Number 24 is the Eau de Parfum of Jiki. The Eau de Toilette is going to be much higher. The Eau de Parfum is here. And um, it's not higher because I don't get the details that I get in the Eau de Toilette. And honestly, had I not smelled a vintage Eau de Toilette, I probably never would have known. Because whenever you smell the Eau de Parfum of Jiki, which I don't know when Guerlain put the Eau de Parfum out. I know originally Jiki came out in the 1880s, I believe, 1889 or something. And of course, it's considered to be the first modern fragrance, okay? That's Jiki's claim to fame. It's also a perfect traditional classic fougere, all right? So it has the, you know, the lavender, geranium, kumarin feel to it. Uh, tonka bean with civet. And when you just smell the eau de parfum, if you spray this on a blotter and leave it overnight, when you come back to smell it, you're going to get a huge hit of synthetic civet. All right. Uh, and luckily I like synthetic civet, but that can put people off. There's also some spices and orris and, um, you know, it's got that herbal rosemary in the top. But um, this fragrance can be challenging because it does have this note that is a little off-putting to some. And the way I used to describe it was halitosis, like a halitosis note. You know, like that note where you sleep all night, you wake up in the morning, you haven't brushed your teeth yet, and it has that uh, almost, that's that halitosis is the best way I could put it. And I thought that was a great way to put it, uh, to describe it. It gives you the idea of the picture of what that civet note feels like in here. Some people took offense to that, and I see what they mean. I could see how that could come across as offensive. If you absolutely love Jiki or love old Guerlain's, I completely understand. I still can't uh, think of a better way to describe it. Someone came up with a great word, uh, but I, I can't remember exactly what it was right now. Um, but think of that vibe, okay? That's the animalic side of Jiki, but there's also a beautiful traditional fougere, spicy fougere side uh, that, that comes into play. And there's a lot of different stories behind Jiki, different, uh, different founding stories of why it was named Jiki. Was it a love that Amy Guerlain had? You know, was it named after his cousin? Was it this? Was it that? Uh, but Jiki is a must try for a perfume lover. Even if it's not your thing, get yourself a little decant like this and, and just try it. Because if you, if you smell Jiki, when you smell other Guerlain's, especially some of the more popular ones we'll talk about later on, um, sometimes you'll be able to kind of smell Jiki's influence on some of these fragrances. So uh, it is a classy fougere, but it does have this animalic bite to it. So that's why it's coming in at uh, number 24. Number 23 is... Uh, a fragrance that I just recently acquired within the last month, thanks to N Natalia. Thank you very much, Natalia. You've been an absolute lifesaver finding some of the, some of these uh, hard to find frags for me, so I very much appreciate it. Uh, and this is number twenty three is Ombre Eternal, which is a fragrance that only came out in twenty um, sixteen. All right, and it's already discontinued. It only lasted two years. So it lasted until 2018, and this is a 2018 bottle, 8B01. So this is the last year they made Ombre Eternal, and they immediately discontinued it. Um, this is so good, though. I I love this stuff so much. It is coriander, cardamom, ambergris, and again, in these, um, these Middle Eastern line, whatever Guerlain calls this line now, I can remember, De Desert to Orient or whatever it is. Um, Terry Vosser claims that they, he, that they use real ambergris. And it definitely smells like there's real ambergris in these two. These two are the ones that you can really smell the real ambergris in. Ansans Mythique, which you can still go by, which I would highly recommend it if you don't have a bottle. And this one might be a little tougher for you to find. Ombre Eternal took me years of hunting to find a bottle. Um, but I, I absolutely love it. 
uh, the ambergris will hit you right from the beginning, but you'll also get this spicy amber. So it's both. It's an ambergris fragrance and an amber fragrance. Uh, but it dries to this orange blossom absolute with leather. All right, so leather and this Middle Eastern woody vibe. Uh, but the amber plays a huge role. Uh, and so does the ambergris. And I totally see why it got discontinued. I bet you they used a big hunk of ambergris in here. And it was just too expensive to keep the uh, fragrance going. It smells like that's the case. But I don't know for sure if that's what it is. Okay, number 22 is my favorite from the Guerlain Middle Eastern line, if you will. It is also the first... Uh, I believe it, it was the first. This this fragrance started out as a challenge. So basically someone from the Middle East, when Thierry Vassar traveled to the Middle East one day uh, back in 2010 or whatever it was, um, said, you Frenchmen do not know how to make Middle Eastern perfume. Okay, so it was like a challenge. And Thierry Vassar took that challenge and he created this. He initially created something called Sange du Bois de Et, which then turned into Bois Mastidio, okay? So this is a great example of what I mean by Guerlain loves changing names and packaging. These are the same fragrance. Um, now, some people say there are slight differences here and there, but to my nose, I think they're basically the same perfume. Um, and it's bay leaf with neroli, patchouli, saffron, jasmine, and cedar uh, with leather and myrrh. Now, if you look on some sites, like if you go to Fragrantica, I think Fragrantica lists oud. I don't think there's any oud in this fragrance or there's no oud accord. It doesn't feel like there's oud. Um, you know, I, I've said before, like on some of those Rosia fragrances, like um, Majestic Oud, where it doesn't feel like uh, it smells like you're smelling oud, but it feels like maybe someone that didn't know what oud smelled like, other than that it, it's had this exotic Middle Eastern vibe to it then they might think they're smelling oud in here, but this is leather and myrrh and spices. This is a very spicy, big saffron. Um, you can you can almost smell the, the green bay leaf in here with leather and myrrh. And it is very good. It's a great Middle Eastern fragrance. I think the best of the line. The first was the best of the line. There's some in this line I don't care for. The musk, I'm not a big fan of. The patchouli, I heard, is shite. I've never smelled it. Um, but that's my favorite. So that one's coming in at number 22. Number 21 is a flanker that Anuj sent me. Thank you, Anuj. Uh, Anuj at Enchante Perfumes. And he sent me this little bad boy. And this is a long forgotten flanker. Uh, it's a flanker of Samsara that I'm actually enjoying more than Samsara, believe it or not. It's called Un Air de Samsara. Now, this goes back to my, um, the way that I did this video. These are my favorite fragrances to wear. If I was ranking it based on, you know, importance of the composition and, you know, where it ranks as far as the most important fragrances in Guerlain's history, Samsara would be much higher on the list, okay? This would not beat out Samsara. Uh, but since I'm ranking them based on my personal preference and the ones I like to wear, this beats Samsara to me. Uh, and it definitely smells like there's a beautiful sandalwood note. I don't know if it's Mysore. I don't know what it is. Um, all I know is that this is a fresher jasmine sandalwood with bergamot and narcissus, which is daffodil, which there's like 50 different types of daffodils, which makes it tough to categorize specifically, unless they say. Uh, but the secret ingredient here is mint. And this is a beautiful summer fragrance. 1995, this came out, uh, marketed towards women, completely unisex. I would have no problem wearing this. It's just beautiful. I mean, it's just, there's no other way to say it. It's a beautiful, fresh sandalwood, um, minty jasmine perfume. And the jasmine in here does not bother me like it does in, in Samsara, EDP. So, uh, okay. Next, we're going to a discontinued Guerlain, sadly, at number 20. Uh, it's the very first, it's the first time Mitsuko shows up, but not the last, because again, I'm ranking all the different iterations, but this is the vintage Eau de Cologne version of Mitsuko. 
uh, in the beautiful clock face bottle. So if you take a look at these old Guerlain boxes, uh, you will be able to see that there is a copyright on the side. This one says copyright 1967, but that's when the design of the box was made. Beautiful design, by the way. I love the old Guerlain boxes. Um, and here's the bottle. Beautiful bottle, too. Stunning clock face bottle with the little tag right here. And this is fantastic. I mean, this could easily be higher. I struggled with where to put this because Schieffer is my favorite category to rank, all right? Uh, well, not my, my favorite category to rank. It's my favorite category of fragrance if I ranked it. Uh, and this is probably my least favorite of the Mitsukos that I have. I also have the Eau de Toilette and the Eau de Parfum, which will be higher on the list. But it's just the fact that this has this fresher take to it. And I like uh, my Schieffer's to have a little bit more oomph to them. You know, like Diaghilev is one of my favorites. A big, as Roja would say, Baroque Schieffer, right? Uh, and this is more, if I wanted to wear Mitsuko in the summer, in the heat of the summer, that's when I'd whip out the Eau de Cologne version of Mitsuko. But it's absolutely beautiful. It's got all of the Mitsuko aspects. You know, it's got that bergamot with jasmine and rose. Lilac and peach, ylang, ambergris, oak moss. The spices are there. The vetiver is there. The cinnamon is there. Oh, it's so good. Um, probably objectively, all right, not my favorite to wear because my favorite Shifra is probably Diaghilev to wear, but objectively, Mitsuko is the best Shifra ever created, in, in my humble opinion. All right, so the Eau de Cologne of Mitsuko comes in at number 20. Number 19, uh, a long-lost uh, vintage Guerlain that you can still buy at a relatively fair price because it's not hyped. No one talks about it, but I love this. It's probably one of my favorite uh, of this category. So, so when you talk about, again, this is a Shepra, again. Uh, so when you talk about this, you know, fresh, uh, citrusy, uh, spicy, woody category of Shepra. This, uh, this is probably, I would much prefer to wear this over something like, say, uh, Chanel's Poor Monsieur, right? You put this head-to-head -head with Poor Monsieur, even though this came out in 1998 and Poor Monsieur came out in the 50s, I'm taking the Guerlain. Uh, but this is called Coriolan, and literally one of the best bottles you've ever seen. Uh, just a complete work of art. And I think this was supposed to be like a um, gunpowder pouch, if I if I if my memory serves correctly, but don't quote me on it. But uh, Coriolan is named after a Roman, a famous Roman general. You can go read the story about him if you'd like. And this was the last main masculine release that LVMH allowed Jean Paul Guerlain to basically put out on his own. Uh, he made a couple other things after this, and he actually made a masterpiece after this no one talks about, but I, I will mention it. Even though I'm looking for a bottle, I'll, I'll give you guys my honest take on it. Um, even though it may hamper my ability to find a bottle, I am still looking for a bottle of it. Um, but this Coriolan you can find, I think I found two of these 50 mil bottles for like 90 bucks a couple years ago for both. Um, and that was like on American eBay. That was... Uh, just what the prices are. No one talks about this. There's also a Guerlain did what it loves to do as far as changing the names of the perfumes, right? And they did it again with Coriolan. They discontinued this like a year in. All right. No one bought it. No one was buying this type of scent in the in 1998 when this came out. They were all buying the Calone, fresher, you know, aquatic type fragrances. Um and then a couple years after this, so in 2008, uh, a decade later, Thierry Wasser uh, and Jean-Paul Guerlain put out Lame Dune Eros, which I actually have a decant of, and I've done a comparison of the two. There's a comparison video up on my channel. You can go check it out. But um, I think Thierry Wasser and Jean-Paul Guerlain um, had to play with some things in Lame Dune Eros. Like, for example, I think they used an everlasting flower note in the bass to try to, which is um, Immortelle. 
So I think they used Immortelle in the base to try to give the impression of an oak mossy base, even though they couldn't use oak moss in 2008 like they did in, in this version. But if you buy this version of Coriolan, the older vintage, make sure you try to get a sealed or an unsprayed bottle because when you have a bottle of perfume like this, the clock really starts. I mean, there's always degradation as the years go by. You can't stop that. But the clock really starts when you first spray it, once air gets into the bottle. And so this is a citrus heavy fragrance. There's a lot of bergamot, neroli, petit gras, lemon, and herbs like sage and basil and ginger and coriander and stuff like that, nutmeg. Um, and so the top notes, the citrusy top notes, bergamot, lemon, neroli, um, those are uh, most apt to turn on you. So I've had a lot of people say that their bottles have turned. Luckily, mine haven't, but be careful buying secondary with uh, Coriolan. You really want to get something sealed if possible. Okay, uh, so that was number 20... 19, sorry. Number 19 was Coriolan. Number 18 is a fragrance that's had a little bit of a meteoric rise for me. Uh, I initially really disliked it. It was a very complex fragrance, and uh, it smells very similar to a... Uh, hard to find Dior, which is called um, Dior Essence. All right, so to me, there's lots of similarities to Dior Essence. And the fragrance in uh, that we're talking about at number 18 is called Shamad. Now, this is the Eau de Toilette. Um, I would love to smell the X-ray of Shamad, which Honestly, the X-Ray of Shimad probably has the most beautiful bottle ever created, ever, okay? Uh, it's that inverted heart bottle with the ridges. And I think there's stories with the ridges too, but I, I don't know. You'd have to look up the story. I couldn't recreate it for you on, on this video. Um, but Shimad came out in um, 1969. The same year as Dior Essence, interestingly enough. And these two are really two peas in a pod. I would love to know who came out first. If anyone knows for sure whether it was uh, Guerlain, Shamad, which came out first, or whether it was Dior's Dior Essence by Guy Robert, which came out first, I would love to know. But obviously the two French houses were vying with each other for um, you know, control of the, of the market. They're both targeted towards women. But they both have this absolutely beautiful, um, complex, two of the most complex fragrances I've ever smelled. There's so much going on in these two. Um, you know, there's floral aspects, there's green aspects. Shamad has a beautiful galbanum. It is very spicy, okay? So when you first spray, uh, you're going to get the aldehydes and the florals like you would expect from a 60s uh, feminine targeted fragrance. But you're also going to get clove uh, and spices. And the base is resins, lots of resins, benzoin, peru balsam, tolu balsam, ambers, and vanilla and stuff like that uh, with vetiver, which is historically a very masculine note. Vetiver for me, when I think of vetiver, I always think of masculine perfumes um, and sandalwood. And it's a beautiful creation. Uh, it, it's taken a while for me to come to that conclusion but I think it, it absolutely is a beautiful creation. And so you will hear me talk more about this little beauty very soon on the channel. So that is uh, number 18, Shamad Eau de Toilette. And again, if you like Shamad, uh, check out Dior Essence. They are two peas in a pod. Okay, number 17. We're, we're getting to the big hitters. And here's, here's one of them. That again, could easily be number one. I mean, imagine trying to rank the best Guerlain's. It's, it's, it's personal preference once we get to this point. Um, but this is the Great Val de Nuit. Now, this is the Eau de Toilette, which I would love to smell the uh, X-ray in that beautiful propeller bottle. I never have. Um, but the uh, Eau de Toilette works beautifully for me because nine months out of the year here in Texas, it's hot, okay? And so uh, you get that galbanum with the citruses and orange blossom. And then there's this unbelievable aldehydic iris that plays with the vanilla spices. There's oak moss in the base, which makes this very masculine to me. I think this is um, 
I think today, if this came out and you called uh, the Eau de Toilette of Val de Nuit a masculine fragrance, I don't think anyone would really, really bat an eye because it has oak moss uh, and uh, woods. It has sandalwood. And so I have no problem wearing Val de Nuit. But the florals, the vanilla, again, a very uh, swirling fragrance, almost like that propeller on the front of the bottle, the X-ray bottle. Uh, and I think Val de Nuit was the name of a novel, and I think it stood for Night Flight or something like that. I can't, I can't exactly remember. But um, in 1933, the world was obsessed with, you know, with flying. Um, and uh, Guerlain created this little gem, and it is a gem. It is absolutely amazing. I, again, I wish I had the other versions, but uh, Val de Nuit Eau de Toilette will have to sit at number 17. Fantastic perfume. Okay, number 16. Now we're going to whip out the Eau de Toilette of Jiki. So we talked about the Eau de Parfum of Jiki. And number 24, at number 16, it's the Eau de Toilette of Jiki. And this is a no-brainer. When I compare these two, I much prefer this Eau de Toilette. And the problem with doing... Uh, this type of ranked video is that I'm ranking this particular bottle of the Eau de Toilette. I know there are different versions. I think this is probably an 80s bottle. U-T-O-E-A-1-4 is the batch code. So I think this is probably an 80s bottle, but I'm not 100% sure. But the um, fresh lavender, the hesperitic notes, uh, and really the depth when I smell this Jiki in Eau de Toilette form, and I compare it to this Jiki in Eau de Parfum form, there is something, uh, tant you know, almost tantalizing. It almost puts you in a trance the first 10 minutes uh, because of just the way that the fragrance opens up and the depth of it. You know, it is... Um, some people call it dandy. I don't think this is dandy at all, personally. It did come out in 1889, uh, and it does have that, you know, that vintage feel to it. But with how crazy the niche market is nowadays and how niche is just copying older fragrances, um, if you're into stuff that is a little bit challenging and you've never smelled Jiki, I would recommend the Eau de Toilette. Now, is the new Eau de Toilette as good as this one? That I have no clue. I've never actually smelled the new stuff. But uh, man, the spices, the ambergris, the woods, the frankincense, the florals, the lavender, the er the herbal aspect, the citrusy freshness. It is just fresh, lavender, hesperitic, and animalic. Beautiful. Stunning fragrance. Uh, and thank you, Anuj, for finding me this old bottle of Jiki. Okay, uh, next on the list, we're going to number 15. And number 15 is another all-time classic. We're getting into the big guns here, boys and girls. Uh, this is Le Bleu Eau de Toilette. Uh, I really, really struggled with where to put this because I know I said Ensemble Mythique is an introspective fragrance, and it is. It absolutely is. But to me... This is the king or queen of introspective fragrances. I mean, I just think about a world gone by. I think about all the poor men and women who suffered during World War I, during the, the wars, the, you know, famine that came after the, uh, you know, disease, everything that happened, the world on the, the brink of war, people dying in the trenches. They were, you know, they deployed... Um, gas they gassed each other it was just a terrible war and you know Lair Blue uh is that I think about all of that when I wear Lair Blue it's very introspective but you also think about the past and you know one of the best quotes of all time was put out uh when Lair Blue was being created uh by Jacques Guerlain probably one of the greatest perfumers of all time and he basically said that he felt something so profound that he he could only explain it in a perfume. How's that for uh, a perfume quote? Probably the best perfume quote of all time, in my opinion. And this does have this flowery, powdery, so floral, powdery, 
um, is the way that the fragrance transitions. There's anise, there's old school carnation, there's neroli, there's violet. Uh, and that, think about the most purple, deep violet you could ever imagine. That's the color that my brain sees when I wear a little blue. And it's meant to be that way because it's supposed to be uh, basically the hour uh, where the sun is just kind of going down on the horizon. It's almost completely gone or is completely gone, but there's still that light in the sky right before full dark takes over. Um, I think it means the blue hour, if I'm not mistaken. But it has the uh, guerlainade in the base, that tonka vanilla benzoin ambery thing that they created that's just stunning. Uh, the iris and the violet is stunning. And when I first smelled this, I said, this is the best version of Le Blue, the Eau de Toilette, 100%. But as you can see, the Eau de Parfum is actually ranked a little bit higher. And I think it's because, and we'll get to it in just a second, but I think it's because it just suits this scent a little bit more. I think this is meant to be a heavier um, fragrance. But if I wanted to wear Le Blue in the summer, uh, this is what I would wear. But it is a very emotional scent for me. Le Blue um, really does move me. Uh, okay, so... Next on the list, we've got number 14, and this is not discontinued, but you've got to get it from the Paris Boutique only, unfortunately. And, excuse me whilst I hydrate. Okay, number 14 is Mouchoir de Monsieur. Um, probably one of the best, again, fougères ever created. And I prefer this over Jiki, uh, and I don't know why. Maybe it is because um, it says it's made for men. I don't know. There is this beautiful lemon ver vervain note that is missing from Jiki, uh, and it does feel like maybe the cinnamon is a little amped up. Uh, maybe the oak moss in the base is a little amped up, but I just... I think this is the best version of, uh, almost like an improved version of Jiki for me. Uh, I don't get as much of that halitosis note. There is still civet. It's still animalic, but I like the way that the civet kind of moves in this fragrance a little different. Uh, and originally, Mouchoir de Monsieur is... Um, named after the tradition in the old days where if you went out to a club or a bar or something, men would bring a uh, tissue or, you know, napkin or whatever it was, uh, you know, what do they call them now? Pocket sleeves. They would bring a pocket sleeve. And what they would do is if they met a woman that they really liked, they would actually spray the fragrance. Well, or beforehand, they would spray it with uh, the fragrance. And if they met if they met a woman that they really fancied, they would give them the pocket square to remember them by. Interesting uh, dating ritual that they had back then. Uh, they were a little more classy than now. Could you imagine showing someone from 1904 a club today? Uh, their head would explode. All right, uh, next we're going to number 13. And it's the reemergence of Le Bleu, this time in Eau de Parfum. So the best version of Le Bleu for me, and this is just a crappy little refill, but, you know, I don't care. It's about the juice, not the bottle. And, you know, what, what else can I say about Le Bleu? I mean, I'll, do, I'll try to do a full review on it. I think, that there, I think that I much better understand Le Bleu now that I've had a chance to do a video on Apres Londe. This is a very important perfume. So again, even if that's not your thing, I would still urge you as a frag head to get your nose on Apres Londe because I think I much better understand uh, that anise opening, you know, uh, because of the, sorry, my daughter's screaming in the background. I don't know if you could hear, her. but um, because of the para anise aldehyde that was used in Apres Londe, uh, I much more understand the anise opening with the violet and the heliotrope. And I often said that Le Bleu is a big heliotrope fragrance. And if you look on the back of this little tester bottle of Le Bleu that I have from the 80s, you'll see it says heliotrope right there. And the heliotrope really does stand out in both versions. 
but the EDP is more. It's it's thicker. It's richer to me. Okay, um, number twelve, and this was a very. I had such a hard time ranking this, but uh, because I love wearing this, and this this scent really makes me feel uh, special. Like I'm wearing something very special when I wear this fragrance. But uh, I couldn't put it any higher just because of, you know, how everything, how the chips have fallen. But this is uh, Lidge, L'Instant de Guerlain. Here's the uh, Eau de Parfum Extreme, and there's the original with the black around the outline. I pulled out the big guns for you guys for this video. So, um, luckily I have two bottles. I have a backup. I feel very comfortable. They're both 75 mils. I love the bottle, by the way. I love when Guerlain used to make their own bottle for each scent. Uh, and L'Instant de Guerlain <sighs> took that patchouli that was so masterfully used in Heritage, which is much higher on the list. And uh, Beatrice Piquet, who made uh, Trussardi Uomo in 1983, she made two of my favorite fragrances of all time, Trussardi Uomo in 83, and then she made this in conjunction with Jean-Paul Guerlain in 2005, but Beatrice Piquet is officially the perfumer of note. And there's this Elemi, oh God, the Elemi, the star anise, the citruses, um, you know, mixed with the cacao, the tea, the hibiscus seeds, the patchouli, the patchouli is just stunning. Patchouli, patchouli blossom, cedar, sandalwood. It's, I mean, what a fragrance they created. And, um, you know, the way that the patchouli was uh, almost plucked from Heritage and then used as this, you know, heart, it was almost like, you know, they built an entire solar system around this patchouli. It's just a stunning, stunning scent. I, every time I wear this, I feel like a million bucks. That is a special trait in a perfume, and that's why I have a backup. Uh, so number 11 is, or number 12 is L'Instant de Guerlain. Easily could be number one on many people's list though. Very, very good fragrance. All right, uh, number 11 is here, and I actually have a review on this. This is a very rare, hard to find Guerlain. It's called Jeddi. Now Jeddi is, uh, there's an entire story behind Jeddi. You can go check it out if you want to kind of do some research on it. But in a nutshell, Jeddi was based on an ancient Egyptian magician who was re reportedly able to bring back the dead to life. Okay, that's the story. And Jeddi was sold up until about the 1950s. It was never part of Guerlain's classic range. And then to celebrate its 70th anniversary, uh, a true of the original... 60 mil model copy was issued in limited edition in 1996. If you got a full bottle of Jeddi right now from that 1996 re-release, it's about a $10,000 perfume. It's probably one of the most expensive fragrances money can buy right now uh, because it's so rare and so hard to find. But God, it's good. Um, aldehydes and lily, lily of the Valley with bergamot, jasmine, rose, iris, vetiver. Vetiver is one of the key notes. It's like an animalic vetiver. And there is these different animalic notes. There is something mysterious about it. There is, you know, if you've read the Stephen King uh, Dark Tower series, Gunslinger series of books, um, and you know Stephen King's, uh, you know, main bad guy character, uh, the man in black is how he's constantly referred to. The man in black is how is how Stephen King refers to him. Um, and he shows up over and over again in Stephen King's book as like this recurring uh, evil character, if you will. This is how I would imagine him to smell. This magician with powers, um, but something evil underneath, you know. But it's such an interesting fragrance. And there's something very leathery about it. Even though there's no leathery notes listed, I get a big leather vibe. And I think that's probably from the Castorium. And you know, in the 1920s, when this came out, Guerlain, this came out in 1926. This came out right after one of the best, well, uh, you're going to see the best fragrance uh, Guerlain ever put out, in my opinion. And that used a Castorium note, I believe. And I think this does too, but there could be other animalics in conjunction with the Castorium. But I think the castorium gives it this leathery 
animalic vibe. But if you've never smelled Jeddy and you're a Fraghead, at least you don't have to go spend 10 grand on a bottle, but at least go um, go try to get a small sample and, and smell it. It's something you'll remember forever. And in fact, I did an interview with Russian Adam and he, sa he said that uh, he ordered a sample of this and while he was waiting for the sample to arrive, he created War and Peace. And he created War and Peace, which is one of my favorite fragrances. One of the, luckily, one of the few uh, Riz Lodores I was able to get a full bottle of. Uh, he he created War and Peace as his imagination of what Jeddy smelled like before he ever smelled it. Like a representation of what he imagined Jeddy would smell like. Just an interesting tidbit of information for you there. Okay, now this fragrance has shot up the ranks for me. Um, when I first got it, I said, okay, probably the best vetiver of all time, but it's not for me. And then my stance became probably the best vetiver of all time. It's warming, I'm warming up to it, but I much prefer other vetivers like Ancre Noir. And while I still think I prefer that deeper, darker, rootier, earthy vetiver, this is probably the best vetiver fragrance ever of all time. No, no question asked. I don't think anyone would argue with you if you said that as a, as a fact. If you said, hey, this is my favorite vetiver, you would just say, hey, great choice, mate. Uh, this is Guerlain's Vetiver from 1959. Uh, there is a story to this bottle as well. Each one of these rungs represents uh, a stage in a man's life. Okay, and there's an entire story behind it. You can go check it out. Again, the beauty of the old gear. One of the most beautiful bottles of all time. Uh, the ribbed, ribbed for your pleasure. And man, is vetiver pleasurable. It It's really grown on me. Um, it's got orange, bergamot, and lemon with nutmeg, pepper, vetiver, tobacco, and tonka. And I think that tobacco is what sets this fragrance to another level. It really does smell like you're smelling um, like you're outside, you know, on a beautiful spring day. Uh, the grass is green. You know, it has that green grassy vibe to it. And normally I like my vetivers to be more rooty and earthy and dark and um, deeper, richer, almost muddy. I like my vetivers to be muddy. Muddy is a great word. This is the exact opposite of that. This is clean, green. There is spiciness from the pepper and the nutmeg, but man, that tobacco is just so perfect. And it, and it could be one of the best tobacco notes in a fragrance that no one talks about. When people do a top tobacco, and I'll rank my top tobaccos, but no one ever talks about this fragrance and they easily could. The tobacco in here is stunning. And so is the bottle, Guerlain's Vetiver. Uh, and the good thing about Guerlain is many a times you can just go buy whatever the, you know, modern version is, right? You don't have to go hunt down vintages because they do very good reformulations. However, someone was recently talking to me about how the new versions, because they put Vetiver, they put Abbey Rouge, they put Guerlain Om, they put Heritage, you know, all of these... Um, fragrances they put in this bottle, okay? And they were saying that the new versions of Abbey Rouge or Heritage in this bottle are not as good, that they have been reformulated. I've never smelled that, but that's the rumor around the campfire, okay? So if you can find these older, you know, Listerine style bottles uh, and you're and you're on the hunt for Guerlain's, do it. Get the Vetiver and the Listerine bottle because, you know, I don't know if the new one that's in this bottle is as good. So that's the rumor anyways around the campfire. Okay. Next on the list, um, at number nine, we've got the um, Pure Parfum, or the X-Tray of Shalimar. Okay, so the reason that this beautiful presentation again, I love these that Guerlain does, uh, the reason that this is not higher is because the Pure Parfum of um, Shalimar, and this is copyright 1999, I think this is about 20 years ago, is my guess. I don't know exactly what batch code is uh, UK. Sorry, I can't read it. Uh, 
I can't read it. Um, but I think it's about 20 years old based on the packaging and stuff like that. But uh, the reason that this is number nine and not higher, and by the way, the X-Ray of Shalimar is ranked number one in women's perfume. It's 2022, guy. you know, 2022. And Shalimar from 1925, the X-Ray is ranked number one. How about that? Insanity. But um, the iris and the jasmine, the rose is amped up in here. It also smells like there's some heliotrope, maybe even some lilacs or, you know, there's uh, a bouquet of flowers that you don't smell in the Eau de Toilette and the Eau de Parfum. Um, a blossom of flowers really shows up in the X, in the X-ray, the Pure Parfum. Uh, you still get the vanilla, the balsamic notes, and it's still identifiable as Shalimar, but... Um, I prefer the Eau de Toilette and the Eau de Parfum, but this is still an amazing fragrance. This is one of the only X-rays I've been lucky enough to um, experience. I think maybe Jedi is an X-ray as well. So there's two X-rays that I've been lucky enough to experience, but uh, I, I never got a chance to smell the X-ray of, you know, Val de Nuit or Mitsuko, Shalom, you know, uh, some of these other ones. Uh, Samsara. I haven't got a chance to smell the X-rays of, of many of them. Oh, and Happy Rouge, of course. I got the X-ray. That was on the list. Okay, uh, let's continue. Number eight uh, is this little gem. Again, back to the greatest sheep, sheep fr fragrance of all time. The greatest sheep. And it is Mitsuko Eau de Toilette. So the greatest sheeper of all time is Mitsuko Eau de Toilette, in my opinion. Um... And any, any version, honestly, of Mitsuko, it, it, you know, Mitsuko is what it is. But the Eau de Toilette comes in at number eight. Um, and this, again, this bottle in particular, this uh, UK OFB2, this, this 80s version or early 90s version is stunning. It is a little fresher than the Eau de Parfum, uh, but that peach note just really pops. The oak moss, there's something mysterious to this fragrance. Uh, the story on Mitsuko, some people don't like, you know, it's about a woman who was in love with uh, someone other than her husband, which is a very risque story to put out there in 1919 when this came out, 1919. Uh, but man, what a sheepra they created. Just amazing. You know, there's no reason to go spend $2,000 on roses, sheepra extraordinaire, when you've got stuff like this floating around out there. It's just... And every time I wear this, I, I almost punch myself and say, what are you doing? Why are you messing with all these other niche houses when you have this? You have one of the great, you know, one of the best uh, fragrances out there and you're out sniffing a million other perfumes. Just go home. Go home and wear this, you know? Oh, it's so good. Uh, but my favorite Mitsuko is, is the Eau de Parfum, okay? And the reason it's my favorite is... Uh, 4T01 is the batch code on this one, which I think could be a 2014. I'm not sure, but this is an amazing fragrance. Um, the Eau de Parfum is my favorite because it's just a little bit heavier. It's a little richer. It's a heavy, thick fragrance. If you like your Chypres rich, heavy, like if you like something like Diaghilev, uh, if you like your Chypres to be, you know, really rich and thick, like Rochas Femme, uh, Eau de Parfum of Mitsuko. I'd love to smell the X-Ray. Absolutely would love it, but I, I never have gotten the chance yet. But uh, this is an amazing fragrance. Uh, the Eau de Parfum comes in for Mitsuko, comes in at number seven. Number six is the one I was telling you guys about earlier that I am on a hunt for a full bottle. In fact, if right now you said, Ramsey, just forget about price. Pick one bottle. I'll let you get one bottle of anything out there. Anything at all. Period. I would pick this. This would be my one bottle. Uh, it's Guerlain's Metallica. Now, Metallica actually sued Guerlain. This came out in um, the year 2000. The band Metallica actually sued Guerlain, believe it or not. And... God. Oh, this is the only vanilla, <clears throat> the reason I want a full bottle of this, this is the only vanilla fragrance I've ever come across in my entire life that can compete with Shalimar. 
and it's another Guerlain. How about that? Only a Guerlain can, uh, Jean-Paul Guerlain said only a Guerlain can make a Guerlain. I'm going to say only a Guerlain can compete with a Guerlain when it comes to vanilla. This is one of the most underappreciated uh, fragrances I've ever smelled. People should be shouting from the rooftops the beauty of me Metal. They had to change the name to Metalis, uh, but it was originally Metallica. I don't care what bottle I get. If it's Metalis, Metallica, I could give, you know, I don't care. I just want a bottle because this stuff is so good. God. I mean, it's got that bergamot vanilla like Shalimar has that bergamot in the top and that's it no other top note and and vanilla and you know Shalimar does this trick where there's like no heart right it's like uh bergamot and then base right and metalis kind of does something very similar but there's a beautiful floral bouquet uh mixed in here carnation orange blossom rose and elang elang God, in that, but that iris, the iris in here is stunning too. One of the best irises I think I've ever smelled. So that's my my wish. That's my wish list. If if you know anyone selling a bottle, please let me know. That's number six. Number five is uh, one of the most iconic masculines of all time. It's the Eau de Toilette of Abbey Rouge. And again, if you can find this bottle, get it. Uh, the Eau de Parfum is a completely different fragrance. It uses oud in the base, which is totally different. Um, I brought out the big boy for you guys, the vintage Eau de Toilette of Abbey Rouge. That's what the old school packaging, you know, this is what the old school packaging looked like. This is one of the newer bottles. But even this, I think, is uh, 9TO2. So I don't know if this is 2009 it's not a 2019, because I've had this in my collection since, I think, 2019. I think this is a 2009 bottle, maybe. Um, and this is an 80s bottle, I believe. Um, JX24B1, maybe? But the thing about uh, the vintage of Abbey Rouge is... Oh man, why do I even wear anything else? I mean, why, honestly? Uh, the, the thing about the vintage of Abbey Rouge is the leather in the base is absolutely stunning. It really comes out with that vanilla, benzoin, the patchouli, and it's just, you know, it's, it, it is powdery. If you don't like powdery scents at all, you won't like this, but I think this is a masterpiece, and I think this is one of the best masculines ever created. Uh, and it, it does have a little bit of that Shalimar, you know, vanilla in the base. Putting a vanilla in the base of a masculine fragrance in 1965 was a little bit of a risk. You know, Jean-Paul Guerlain took a risk, but he created one of the greatest masculines of all time, in my opinion. So, Abbey Rouge, Eau de Toilette comes in at number five. Number four. All right, we're getting to the real big guns here. Number four. Uh, you know it. I mean, this bottle is highly sought after. This is a 90s bottle. Um, and, I mean, I would love a vintage Eagle bottle of this, but uh, I mean, there's no need. I'm happy with this. But it's uh, Guerlain's Darby. And Darby is uh, one of the greatest masculines of all time, in my opinion. It is, um, you know, it competes with stuff like uh, Patu Pour Homme. Um, this came out in 1985. Apparently, rumor is that Jean-Paul Guerlain had help creating this. Uh, he worked with a woman named Anne-Marie Saget, which I've never heard of before, but she was like a flight attendant or something. I don't know what was going on. But they worked together and created this. Uh, and it is bergamot, lemon, mugwort, peppermint, pimento, rose, pepper, nutmeg, jasmine, leather, vetiver, sandalwood, patchouli, and, and oak moss. And uh, you do get a little bit of the peppermint in the opening, but for me, it's mostly about kind of this herbal, spicy, um, just amazing masculine. Uh, the I think this is a Spanish leather. I've come to the conclusion that I think this is a Spanish leather creation. The leather really kind of is tentative. It hides, you know. 
the, the leather doesn't want to come out immediately, even though this is based on, um, you know, this has some horse, uh, you know, there is, there is something with Jean-Paul Guerlain's love of horses with these two right here. Abbey Rouge, uh, the red hunting jacket, and Derby has to do with uh, his love of horses. And, um, you know, the leather really kind of takes its time. It's more about the spiciness for me, the nutmeg, the pimento. I'll do a full review one day. I haven't done it. I'm scared to do a full review on my favorites, to be honest with you, because I'm scared I won't do them justice. But, uh, yeah, Derby is absolutely stunning. Number three is uh, Shalimar Eau de Toilette. 1925, uh, this bottle is something. I mean, Rich Mitch sold me this. Thank you, Rich. You know, uh, there's an entire story behind it. If you go watch the Long Lost Hall unboxing, you'll hear about it. I think this is a 70s bottle. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I think this is an 80s eau de toilette. Again, not 100% sure, but uh, I can tell you they're both amazing. Amazing. God, I, I mean, I've worn this to bed multiple times since I've gotten it, and I want to wear it to bed tonight, too, because there's just something so absolutely calming. I mean, I'm in, I'm in love with Shalimar. Shalimar is um, a very special fragrance for me. Uh, there is just something about the, you know, for me, and I know Coty's Emerald and all that stuff, and I know that came first, but for me, this is the reference Oriental the reference oriental, this vanilla, oh God, Tonka, uh, with that sharp bergamot, you know, in, in the top, something like 30% bergamot, I think is what I read, which bergamot is not a cheap note either. Just an amazing fragrance. Number two, uh, number two is in my, you know, all time greatest masculines, uh, there's something so special about this because this fragrance, um, this fragrance represents Guerlain's past and future. And I know I've said this before, but I whipped out the big bottle for you guys. Uh, so this is Guerlain's Heritage. The gold cap eau de toilette is, uh, I don't think I've smelt a more complex eau de toilette ever. Okay. In, in everything I've sniffed. I don't think I've ever smelled an eau de toilette with such depth and complexity. You know, it, uh, the lavender, coriander, bergamot, lemon, pink pepper, patchouli, tonka, vanilla. It does have this forced floor-like smell when you first spray. The patchouli is a rock star. Um, and then, you know, they took that patchouli and created lidge with it. Okay, so again... You can smell the past in this. You'll smell bits and pieces of jicky with the lavender. Um, there is a slight aldehydic vibe as well. You'll smell a little bit of uh, Abbey Rouge in Heritage as well. You'll basically smell many of the long lost Guerlains. And then you even smell the future. Uh, I think this is supposed to be like Foucault's Pendulum. You can maybe see it better with this. I'm always scared to do it with this one because it's a splash, but... You know, it's uh, supposed to be the, the pendulum showing the rotation of the earth. Um, and I mean, what a, what a fragrance. What an absolute gem of a fragrance this is. The bottle, everything, everything about it uh, is perfect. This is a perfect masculine for me. It's perfection. Uh, I think AC from, from Smells Good, uh, from the channel Smells Good, called this a colossus of a fragrance, and I completely agree. The Eau de Toilette of Heritage is mind-blowing. And the only reason it's not number one, the only reason it's not number one, is because this fragrance, um, the Eau de Parfum, or the Parfum de Toilette, is my favorite Guerlain. I think it's the, you know, uh, it's the centerpiece of Guerlain's, um, it's the centerpiece of Guerlain's creation, if you will, all of the fragrances over the years, all of the big hits we've talked about. Uh, if you walk into a Guerlain store, this is the one that's kind of enshrined in the center of everything, and it's uh, Shalimar Eau de Parfum.
Now, this is an 80s bottle, which they used to call Eau de Parfum, Parfum de Toilette. I don't know if you can see it. The bottom's a little dirty, but Parfum de Toilette is what they used to call it. Look at that. Copyright 1982. How cool is that? Um, and so this is probably my favorite, Parfum de Toilette. But this modern Eau de Parfum is still amazing. The modern Eau de Parfum is still amazing. It has that richness to it, that depth. Oh, man. I don't know if you could do vanilla any better. It has, you know, the backstory with uh, the Taj Mahal. You can go read about that. Uh, and, you know, how his wife died and he was obviously broken up over it. Um, he never remarried, but this has this warmth to it. You know, if you imagine two bodies, two people who are in love, making love outside, uh, and the uh, iconic Shalimar bottle itself, The if, if you just go to Parfumo, type in Shalimar, Eau de Parfum, you'll see the iconic bottle. It's, it's probably my favorite bottle of all time, which I don't even have here, but, you know, that uh, iconic Shalimar bottle, the blue on top can represent a woman's headdress that they used to wear in the old days. The, the, the queens would wear, uh, or it could represent the blue of water from the fountains around Shalimar. There's a ton of fountains at the Taj Mahal, but I mean, everything, the story, the fragrance, the way it makes me feel, the uh, way that this fragrance opened up an entire new genre for me. Shalimar, um, went from I only buy masculines and I and I and I love wearing masculine fragrances and you know the Coros, the Antaeus, the Leonard Porhomes, all of the masculines I love, the Bellamy, that's what I wear and that's that, to opening up an entire, you know, it was it was like I was looking at the fragrance world with one eye shut, right? Because I was shutting half of the fragrances out. If it said feminine, I wasn't even paying attention to it. This fragrance completely changed that for me. This fragrance um, completely changed how I think about fragrance. And I am 100% in love with Shalimar. It is, uh, it is so good. And you would be shocked at the, uh, you would be shocked at the response if I wear this out in public. Shocked. And, and people love it. I mean, they absolutely love Shalimar uh, on a man or on a woman. Like I said, the X-Tray is the number one ranked perfume for, for in the top women's 100 countdown on Parfumo. I didn't even know that until I pulled it up right now. That's insane to me. Um, I mean, what a fragrance. What, what a creation. And the fact that Guerlain has been able to keep it in its modern form for as much grief as we give the House of Guerlain, all these reformulations and stuff like that and all these different new fragrances and, you know, ouds and high-priced, overpriced stuff and changing the bottles and all that, the fact that they're able to keep, you know, the, um, the Shalimars, the uh, Mitsukos, right, the Vetivers, the Le Blues, the fact that they're able to keep fragrances like this in such good shape, they deserve to be applauded, honestly. And if you are new to perfume, there is no better house to go explore than Guerlain. Sometimes I feel like you don't even have to leave the house of Guerlain. Just go dive headfirst into the house of Guerlain and, you know, don't even put your head back above water. Just explore everything and you'll have a lifetime of fragrances to explore. But um, I hope you guys appreciated this. I know it's an hour and a half, an hour and 40 minutes almost. So I appreciate everyone's, um, you know, attention and watching. And I'd love to hear your feedback on this uh, this top 35 countdown that I did. Uh, so let me know what you think down below. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Appreciate the support, the comments. I love the interaction with you guys. Uh, if anyone does know where to find a bottle of Metallica, seriously, do let me know because I've been on the hunt for a long time and it is elusive, but damn, it's good. Uh, and I do have a full review of Metallica on the channel. If you go to Guerlain, uh, playlist, you'll be able to find it. So anyways, thanks for watching everyone. Cheers guys. See you next time with another video. Bye now.